team here at Columbia. Uh, my presentation this morning will discuss our uh, safety study. Uh, so we heard earlier that the primary safety factor built into some of these far UVC wavelengths and the idea of far UV is that it is so highly absorbed by biological materials uh, in the skin is what I'm going to talk about today in this talk, um, where it's so much the absorption occurs in the outer stratum corneum of the epidermis. Um, some data just kind of illustrating this, there's great modeling done uh, showing that wavelengths below about 230 or 240 are entirely absorbed within the, the purple region, which is the stratum corneum. It doesn't even reach the uh, the epidermis and much and nothing into the germinative basal layer of the epidermis. And we've done some uh, in vitro studies. Uh, Dr. Brenner mentioned this in his earlier talk, where we used our monochromator to expose an in vitro um, artificial uh, skin model uh, to a single dose of 100 millijoules per centimeter squared, but using wavelengths from 215 to 255 in a two nanometer full width half max. And we see a, a huge drop in the amount of CPDs that were formed in the epidermis uh, with wavelengths less than 240. Uh, but uh, all of these uh, causes of concern for health effects are built into safety regulations, um, including the ACGIH limits. Uh, they typically have the what they call the TLV, and that is supposed to cover all safety and health effects uh, for eyes and skin, for short and long-term exposures, all built into one safety factor. Uh, there's various sources of data that were used to establish these TLVs um, from decades worth of work. Uh, I'll highlight some of the data that was used for the eye TL, uh, uh, to establish some of the eye effects of these wavelengths is shown in the bottom up, uh, here. Uh, but you'll note that much of this data doesn't extend uh, past 220. And many of these studies were done with a very wide bandwidth source. Uh, so even though they had a center wavelength of 220, uh, they might have had a 10 or 15 nanometer full width half max. So they would have seen effects from some of the longer wavelengths also built into that center wavelength of 220. Uh, so what do we want to do? We want to get very accurate TLVs um, with as much data as possible. Um, there's some been a, a few studies that have looked at uh, specifically at 222, and then just a couple other wavelengths where sources have been widely available, maybe 235. Uh, some of the, the lasers that have been used at uh, uh, have also for cornea uh, procedures have also been used. Uh, but this is a, a great study that it actually was a, a pilot study to expose a human forearm. And in that study, they went up to 18,000 millijoules per centimeter squared with a 222 lamp, and they didn't see any erythema. Uh, there was a, a tiny bit of yellowing that was evident in the skin, but not er erythema. Uh, but more data is definitely necessary. Uh, despite or uh, with the help of many of these studies that have used a few wavelengths in the throughout the UVC, uh, the ACGIH recently updated their TLV limits, uh, their TLV recommendations. Uh, they actually split the eye exposure limit and the skin exposure limit and really increase the dose that is allowed in an eight hour period for wavelengths less than about 240 nanometers. Uh, we're really hoping to improve these recommendations as much as possible. And the reason for that is that we wanna know what the limits are so that we can apply an effective antimicrobial dose because a, a higher antimicrobial dose while still being safe will allow for safer environments. And we wanna know how much filtering is necessary. Um, not all sources are going to be a perfect line source. We know that a krypton chlorine lamp has emissions up to about 260. We also know that LEDs that are being developed in the far UVC range also have tails that extend up to 230, up to 240, 250. And we need to know how much filtering is really necessary of those sources. And ideally, the TLV would be used uh, to evaluate any lamp accurately. So you would multiply the hazard factor at each wavelength by the total spectrum output by a, a lamp or other emitter, and then you could figure out the total health hazard. Uh, so we're in, currently in the middle of a safety study to systematically evaluate the wavelength dependence of uh, acute skin hazard. Uh, so this is just one component that would be factored into the TLV, but it is a very important one. 
Uh, for these studies, we're using a hairless mouse model. This is an SKH1 mouse. Uh, it's been used for previous studies of erythema and uh, non-melanoma skin cancer, so it's a very established model. It doesn't have any hair, so it makes it easy for us to directly expose the skin and then evaluate for um, damage. Uh, interestingly, uh, these mice do not exhibit erythema with UVC exposure. Instead, they exhibit a slight edema, which is a swelling of the skin, or a slight um, fissuring or a little bit of a, a change in the, the texture of the skin that you can see in person the mouse when it happens uh, very visibly. Uh, it's tougher to take a picture of. So the goal with our study is to find a, the threshold dose for any wavelength throughout the UVC. Uh, so to do these studies, we are using a monochromatic system to get two nanometer full width half max exposures uh, from 200 up to 270. Um, our exposure uh, plan is kind of outlined on, on this slide. Uh, we plan to expose an initial mouse, uh, starting with the what we'll call the old TLVs. These were pre-2022. Uh, every wavelength from 200 to 270 uh, using one of the doses in one section of the back of the mouse, and then two times that, four times that, eight times that, 16 times that, and 32 times that. So we'll expose six, six different sections of the eight that are outlined, uh, marked in a grid on the mouse, and then two controls. And then after that initial expo mouse exposure, we'll then expose a group of eight mice based off the results of the initial mouse. So as an example, at 240, we'd expose for those wavelengths, uh, if we see a positive at 240, that we would then follow up with five different doses to try and narrow down where exactly the erythema started. Uh, this is just an example of how we would evaluate the mouse skin. Uh, it's really tough to see in a picture, uh, but this would be positive in four different spaces. Uh, we evaluated 24, 48, and 72 hours post-exposure. Uh, the primary endpoint was a visual examination of edema and fissure and flaking, as I mentioned. We're also taking skin bifold measurements to attempt to measure edema more precisely. And then later on, we're going to, and then we uh, take biopsies after the 72 hour point, and uh, that will allow for immunohistochemical you know, analysis. These are uh, our initial results with the mouse at each wavelength. Uh, the stars represent. Uh, exposures that did not cause any erythema or edema or any visible change. Uh, the red dots are where we did observe that. Uh, so this is at 24 hours, and I'm going to go quickly here because uh, 48 and then 72. And it's it's difficult to really evaluate this on a linear scale. So I put it on a log scale, and you can kind of see the exposure scenario a lot better. Uh, so at, um, we did not see any erythema or signs of that from any wavelength less than 230 or less than that, even going up to hundreds of millijoules per centimeter squared. I just marked uh, this point to give you a reference. Uh, so some of our exposures were a couple thousand millijoules per centimeter squared uh, when they were less than 210. Uh, but importantly in this graph, you can see that there's a, a steady, pretty steady um, reaction up to about 240, and then just a, a great increase in dose that it actually takes to see erythema. Uh, and also included on this graph is the, the previous TLV, which is the red line, and then the current uh, current I in green and the current blue uh, level in, uh, marked. Uh, so with that, we're currently going through the follow-up cohorts of eight, mouse, eight mice in each wavelength. These are just some examples of the data. The most interesting part of that graph where there's the transition from uh, seeing no erythema at 230 up to about 240. And these are preliminary results, so we don't have the full cohorts from each of the, the wavelengths yet. Uh, but you can imagine how uh, we would identify a threshold at, at 235, somewhere in the probably about the 208. Uh, but then for 240, we're looking at probably about 12 and a half. So it's about 20 times uh, the dose just in that small five nanometer change. And then the conclusions from this, uh, testing is still underway, but we're gathering results, and the preliminary results suggest uh, that there's a rapid change in the action spectrum for skin acute skin exposure health hazard in between 235 and 240, and that even the 2022 updated TLVs may be too conservative in the far UVC range. And that's just for acute skin exposure, recognizing that all the other exposure scenarios also play into TLVs. Uh, so recognizing the research team, 
We have a great team here at Columbia. I'd like to highlight Rabia Hashmi and Cameron Peterson, our two technicians that are very helpful in all this work. Thank you very much. Okay, we have time for questions. Ed. Thanks, David. Um, really excellent work. And as you know, I'm a big enthusiast for 222. But I have to say that the implication when we compare these wavelengths is that 222 is safe and 254 is dangerous. Uh, and indeed, as radiation, it, it is more damaging. If, But the way we've used 254 for almost 100 years, it's perfectly safe to use. And I think that I wanted to make that comment also in Ben's talk is that 254 is perfectly safe to use as we use it. 222 will be better if we can use it directly, but we have to remember that it isn't it isn't a dangerous technology as we use it. Yeah, that's correct. I completely agree. I don't know. Can you, can you hear me? I, I can, but I think it's better to get it on the mic so that it's picked up in the recording. Yeah, again, this kind of data is extremely important. So I, I thank you for doing that. Um, I One interesting thing, I just wonder if you could comment that you actually seem to show that the activation uh, for getting erythema got uh, higher. I mean, you needed a higher dose as you got to longer wavelength. You know, so there was a, you, you were seeming like you had got a minimum in that range of, of 240. Is that real or is that is that something... Do you suspect in the experiment? It could be. Uh, some of those doses for those longer wavelengths are very close together, and there may be some variation across the different parts of the back that were used. Uh, you know, so we might have um, one area that close to the shoulder might have a little bit thinner stratum corneum than a different place on the back. Uh, but those longer wavelengths, the, the doses were comparing like 10 to 12 or 3 to 6 to 12 at the, with the initial test. So they were pretty close together to begin with. Last question. Uh, what was the half bandwidth on the on the width? How much overlap do you get between the the various at, at low low wavelengths? I mean, uh, so you have a certain bandwidth. Yeah. Right? So we used a, a two nanometer bandwidth. Two nanometer. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you, David.